A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Comfort, give comfort to my people, says the Lord your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her service is at an end. Her guilt is expiated. Indeed, she has received from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the desert prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wasteland a highway for our God. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The rugged land shall be made a plain. The rough country a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. I answer, what shall I cry out? All flesh is grass, and all their glory like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower wilts, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. So then the people is the grass. Though the grass withers and the flower wilts, the word of our God stands forever. Go up onto a high mountain, Zion, herald of glad tidings. Cry out at the top of your voice, Jerusalem, herald of good news. Fear not to cry out, and say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Here comes with power the Lord God, who rules by his strong arm. Here is his reward with him, his recompense before him. Like a shepherd he feeds his flock, in his arms he gathers the lambs, carrying them in his bosom, and leading the ewes with care. Verbum Domini. The Lord our God comes with power. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all you lands. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Announce his salvation day after day. Tell his glory among the nations, among all peoples his wondrous deeds. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. He governs the peoples with equity. The Lord Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and what fills it resound. Let the plains be joyful in all that is in them. Then let all the trees of the forest rejoice. They shall exult before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to rule the earth. He shall rule the world with justice and the peoples with his constancy.
Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Mateum. Gloria Tibi Domine. Jesus said to his disciples, What is your opinion? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, will he not leave the ninety-nine in the hills and go in search of the stray? And if he finds it, Amen, I say to you, he rejoices more over it than over the ninety-nine that did not stray. Just the same way, it is not the will of your heavenly Father that one of these little ones be lost. Verbum Domini. Laus Tibi Christe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Laudator Jesus Christus, praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Today, is the feast of Pope St. Damasus, who many people may not know, but nevertheless is very important in church history, for he is the Pope who commissioned St. Jerome to work on that monumental task of translating the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin. St. Jerome is the one who put together for the first time one volume set of the Bible he had to translate all those documents and parchments and scrolls and took them a while. But thanks to Pope Damasus' request, we have today this wonderful, awesome gift of Almighty God through Holy Mother Church. Pope St. Damasus' family originally came from Spain and then migrated to Italy. He was born in the city of Rome, the year 304. In 366, he became pope. His father had been a priest, and he himself was a deacon before he became pontiff of the Holy Church. He met with great opposition because there were some elements, particularly at that time, who were trying to exert their influence, particularly some heretics who are espousing the Arian heresy which denied the divinity of Christ. In fact, they even put an anti-pope, tried to, to replace him. But Pope Damasus remained resolute, and one of the great things he did besides commissioning St. Jerome to work on the Bible was to reform the clergy in the Diocese of Rome. Now, we must remember that for 300 years, Christians had been persecuted by the Roman Empire. Finally, in 313, the Emperor Constantine issues the Edict of Milan that legalizes Christianity. It was in the final year of Pope Damas's pontificate, however, in 384, that Christianity becomes the state religion of the empire. In that period of his papacy, the clergy in the city of Rome particularly were becoming a bit too comfortable. They were hanging around with the aristocrats. They were living in, in lavish places. They were not taking care of the poor. They were not going out towards the lost sheep. And so this gospel today, I think, epitomizes the spirituality of Pope St. Damasus, the same kind of spirituality that you and I need to cultivate, this idea of the lost sheep. Now, you and I know from our own personal experience you lose something, you go nuts looking for it. You can't find your keys. You can't find the remote control for the television. It doesn't matter you got some place to go or something to do. You're tearing up the whole house looking for those things, right? Looking on, I remember when I was home uh, visiting my mom. For some reason, we couldn't find the remote control for the television. We had just driven like six, seven hours in the car. It's now like 11 o'clock at night, but we got to find that remote control. So we're looking and looking and looking. I'm calling up my brother. Do you know where this remote control is? How would I know where the remote control is? I don't know. I live in Harrisburg, but I said, we got to find this remote control. We looked and looked and looked. Finally, 
We found it. It somehow got kicked by somebody's foot under the couch. But I know that, that consuming desire, I gotta find this. Not like, well, we'll wait till tomorrow morning when we got fresh minds. No, we have to find it now. That's the way God wants us to imagine. He feels when there's a lost sheep. He won't rest until he finds it. He's worried about it. More so than you and I would be worried about lost keys or remote control. The lost sheep means something to him. He knows the 99 are okay. It's not that he's abandoning them. They're safe. It's that lost sheep he's worried about. There are a lot of lost sheep out there today, my friends. There are a lot of lost sheep who don't know they're lost. That's worse yet. They're wandering around. I encountered lost sheep once when I took my mom several, several years ago. We went to Ireland. And we went to the western part of the country, and it was very rural. And as you're driving along these twisting and turning roads, first of all, you're trying to get used to the driving on the left side of the road and the steering wheels on the other side of the car. And then you, you got your mother next to you going, wah, 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 watch out for this, watch out for that. So we're going around, and all of a sudden, every now and then, you see a big billboard. 75 people were killed on this road last month. And then you see these trucks coming at you, and the road's only designed, it's, it looks like it's built for one car, and all of a sudden this truck's coming at you, and you've got to go, and there's no side of the road. There's just the road and then a cliff. So we're driving on here, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes a sheep and stands there. But unlike American sheep, who are a little timid, and, you know, if you toot the horn, they get out of the way, these Irish sheep, they got an attitude, okay? They stand there and say, come on, you want a piece of me? Come on, come on. They won't move. You toot the horn, eh, you know, they, bat, they make noise at you. And it's obvious that these sheep are not where they belong. But they don't care. They don't know they're in a dangerous spot. And then you can see a shepherd somewhere looking for these guys. God is concerned about the lost sheep. And there are sheep out there who are in need of our prayers. These are people who don't know that there is one true God. There's people out there who don't know that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. They don't know that he established his Catholic Church who gave us the sacraments, the wonderful intercession of his blessed mother and the saints, that he gave us his precious body and blood in the Holy Eucharist. They don't know that. Then there are those who do know it and have turned their back and they have fled. We have to pray for them too. Those are the prodigal children, the ones who know what they've left behind and we gotta pray that they finally come to their senses as in the parable the prodigal son does and realizes, I had a good back at home. You know, here I am eating the stuff the pigs eat. I could be at home eating a good meal just as one of my father's servants. I had a good where I was before. So too we have to pray to some of our brothers and sisters who have left the faith, left the church, don't practice anymore, become lukewarm, mediocre, tepid, whatever you want to call it, lapsed Catholics. You ever notice in the newspaper they always tell you so-and-so, a former Catholic, lapsed Catholic, but they never say anything about that of other religions. I'm sure there must be a lapsed Muslim somewhere, okay, uh, a, a lapsed Hindu or Buddhist, but that's, they're never described that way. But if it's a lapsed Catholic, they got to put that in print. The world's fascinated by that. Why? Because there's something different, something unique, something special about Catholic Christianity. It doesn't mean we're better than anyone else. We have this rich patrimony, this rich history, stuff that we need to be proud of, that we want to share with others, that we want them to enjoy, like the sacraments, like the theology, like this wonderful rich church history, the Catholic culture that we've had for these last two millennia. And so we have to think about the lost sheep and help in the pursuit of them. Now, one of the jobs that the clergy has the deacons, the priests, and the bishops, is to preach and to hopefully send the word out. But you're the ones, the lay faithful, you're the ones who that the lost sheep are going to be talking to because they don't want to come to us first. They wouldn't be lost then, would they? They're like those people who drive around, they don't want to ask for directions. No, nope, I know where I'm going. And of course, somebody in the car would say, are you sure? Don't you want to stop and ask directions? No, I don't need to ask directions. Now, you could put anybody's name or face in that equation because we all know somebody who, and these are the days before the GPS was out, 
You know, they didn't want to go to AAA and get the trip tick made up, so they would like to go on their own. And then, of course, the whole family's vacation now has been delayed because they are so stubborn, they won't stop and ask directions. There's some places you don't want to ask for directions, however. Every time I've been in New York City, worst thing to do is roll down the window and ask somebody, hey, buddy, how do I get to this place? Everybody tells you a different direction. Oh, you go down five blocks, you hang left, you go over there. Or if you're in the middle of the country somewhere, they tell you directions that make no sense to you. Well, you go down by the Browns farm, then you make a left, then you go to O'Leary's house, then you go over there, you don't know who these people are. And of course, there's no numbers on anything except there's five mailboxes with names on there, but they don't, aren't attached, you don't know where the houses are. Some people are like that in the spiritual life. You know, they're lost, they're confused, but they refuse to ask for directions. And here's where you can help. If you notice they're lost, you can point out to them, you're going the wrong way, okay? Somebody's on the turnpike going the wrong direction. Hopefully people are going to be tooting the horn saying, you know, go the other way. Instead of somebody just waving to them, then they're going to be in for a treat. Some people are heading the wrong way in the spiritual life. They're not heading towards heaven. They're aiming themselves right to hell. They need our help. They may not listen. They might be stubborn and say, no, no, I'm going to keep going where I want to go. But at least we got to make that effort and try. The lost sheep mean something. They mean something to God. They mean, should mean something to us. And God forbid if you and I should ever be in the position where we're one of the lost sheep, where we're confused, we're disoriented, we don't know where we're going or where we're at. Here's where the direction comes in. And the best kind of direction comes directly from God. That's what Revelation's about. Original sin clouded our mind, darkened our intellect, weakened our will, disordered the lower passions. And so we don't always think clearly. We don't always act properly. And so God helps us by divine grace and especially through divine revelation, he enlightens the mind. But some people are, it's like that, there's a map there, but they don't want to look at it. No, I know a better way. I know a shortcut. My friends, Jesus tells us there's only one way to heaven, through him. The road to heaven is narrow. It twists and turns. It's difficult, but it ends up exactly where you want to go, right to the pearly gates itself. Whereas hell has like 42,000 lanes in it, all right? all smooth and clean and nice, no bumps, no potholes, no hills, no valleys. It's like easy pass. You go right through, you don't even have to put the toll in anymore. But where do you end up? In the bowels of hell. We're not there for the ride, we're there for the destination. Our purpose here in life is to get to heaven. And that's what the role of the church is. Pope St. Damasus knew this. That's why he entrusted to St. Jerome that awesome work of translating the Bible so that we would have the holy written word of God before us, but also through the holy sacraments, especially through this holy mass and the most blessed sacrament, and through the apostolate, the work of the faithful. You're going to encounter people that they may not know they're lost. Well, what do you do? You don't shame them and humiliate them, but with compassion, discretion, we say to them, you know, you know we invite them to come with us, like I mentioned yesterday. Invite somebody to come with you to church. Invite them to come with you to uh, confession, especially if your parish is having a, a penance service. It might be eight, 10, 12 priests. Sometimes people feel a little awkward. I don't wanna go to my pastor, he knows me. You know, we're not allowed to tell anybody anything anyway. And believe me, after you hear sin after sin after sin, you don't remember anything. But people say, no, 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 especially when you're in a little parish. People say, no, no, he knows me too well. Then go to the one next door. Go to the one across the river. Go to the one in the other following town. But invite people to go with you to church, to mass, to confession, and pray for the lost sheep. And the best thing we could do besides praying for them is good, give good example. The saints do it, but guess what? The saints, before they were saints, were human beings here on earth. They were just as vulnerable as you and I. And that's where they started their example, not when they're up in the clouds, but here on earth. So too, you and I have to give a good example. We're gonna mess up too, we're gonna make mistakes, but God gives us a chance to start over again. But if we give good witness, 
if we give a good example, that's going to encourage people. Just like the bad example discourages people into going a bad way, the good example gives them a reason to say, wow, look, if these people can do it, so can I. And there's always somebody in our little circle of family and friends that we need to pray for, the most lost of all of the sheep, to pray for them. Never give up on anyone because God doesn't. May God bless us and Mary keep us.